ビデオ You should know the drill by now. It's the end of July, which means that it's time for the annual video about an anime adaptation of a well known fighting game franchise. Alas, though, I feel like for the past few years I've done this, I've found myself caught in a rut. I don't think I'm even hiding the fact that I pretty much sleepwalk through these videos because why shouldn't I? They are mostly cheap garbage relegated to workaday anime studios who fast track them to completion for easy money. There's more animation and drama to be found in the opening CG cutscenes of these games than in these adaptations. Which, if you know your 90s games, was a pretty low bar to clear. I can't just be giving myself catch penny fighting game anime with laughable English dubs every year, even if said dubs are the best part. Oh! I'll never give it up! Not to anyone! I need to break the cycle I've built for myself and review a fighting game anime that actually might be good, or at the very least have actual money put behind it. I could always do a video on the big one, but no, the moment is just not right yet. Pay no attention to the new game on the horizon. No, what I actually want to do is take a look at the anime that kicked off the frenzy of fighting game adaptations that lasted all the way up to the end of the 90s. And to do that, we have to return to a fighting game we've already covered on this show. Are you ready? And who's the other one, Commissioner? <sighs> Terry Bogard. So, as you know, way back in my first year of doing this thing, I did a video on Fatal Fury the motion picture. It was flawed, but it was never not enjoyable. Practically God's own popcorn anime, showing us how far some fantastic hand animated martial arts action can go in uplifting a mid-tier story. But I was also a lot sloppier in getting videos out on a regular basis, and I often didn't have time to really get to most of the research that I would normally do. So I ended up skipping the anime that came before the motion picture. There is actually a trilogy of Fatal Fury anime adaptations, and the motion picture would not have even existed without the previous titles, Fatal Fury Legend of the Hungry Wolf and Fatal Fury 2 The New Battle. Not only that, but the era of fighting game adaptations that encompassed the entire decade of the 90s would not have been a thing without the success of both of those titles. You be the judge if that's a good or bad thing. <laughs> and that is why I'm choosing to review both of them at the same time. Mostly for efficiency purposes, but also because Discotech has a really good Blu-ray set called Legends of the Hungry Wolf that has both anime, and I highly recommend you buy it for a great value. But now that I've gotten that sales pitch out of the way, what I really hope to get out of this video is to see how exactly these two anime became the massive successes that launched an entire subgenre. So come on, let's get serious. <laughs> Away! Fatal Fury wasn't just any fighting game franchise, it was THE fighting game franchise that put the company SNK on the map. The 80s were a renaissance for the electronic games market in Japan, and that was especially true for the arcade scene. Thanks to more advanced hardware compared to home consoles, developers had more freedom to innovate at their heart's desire. One of these developers was Capcom. In 1987, Capcom released a game called Street Fighter. It was headed up by developer Takashi Nishiyama. Nishiyama originally broke it big with the 1984 eRAM title Kung Fu Master, a game that is considered by many to be the first side-scrolling beat-em-up which became a very popular genre in arcades at that time. After being pushed away by eRAM by Capcom and subsequently developed the 1986 beat-em-up Trojan, Nishiyama wanted to do something new. He took special notes of the boss fights that were in Kung Fu Masters, and decided to center an entire game around those boss fights. A game where instead of fighting groups of enemies, you fought one enemy at a time in a best 2 out of 3 round system, justified by the story taking place in a world of fighting tournaments. Thus, Street Fighter and by extension, the entire fighting game genre was born. While primitive by today's standards, Street Fighter was a huge success, owing much to being the birthplace of many of the genre's standards, such as six-button controls and command-based special moves. 
Nishiyama would not spend time at Capcom for long, however, since he would be invited to join another big player in the software market known as SNK. At that point, SNK had been actively releasing games as early as 1978, but they had only really started to break through with titles such as Ikari Warriors and Athena, the latter which was ported to the NES to wide acclaim. They were looking to take the next step. Nishiyama's first project with SNK was helping develop the Neo Geo. He had proposed the concept of an arcade system that used ROM cartridges just like a game console and could easily have a home console version as well. Nishiyama argued that this would make arcade systems more affordable in markets such as China, Latin America, and South America where rampant software piracy made it difficult to sell cabinets. In spite of the infamously steep price tag the home version carried, the Neo Geo was a success when it was officially released onto the Japanese market on April 26, 1990, and the United States and Australia later that year. But there was something still missing from SNK. If they wanted to really show that they were a big deal games developer, they needed a flagship title. Once again, Nishiyama was summoned to work his magic. Nishiyama looked back on his success with Capcom building Street Fighter, which was currently in the process of getting a sequel without his involvement, and decided to build a spiritual successor to that game. It followed the same methodology of the original Street Fighter, with a special emphasis on performing special moves, an innovative two-lane system, and, most importantly, a story. Where Street Fighter was entirely focused on just a fighting game tournament, Fatal Fury was a story of revenge. Former street urchins Terry Bogard and his younger brother Andy witnessed the brutal murder of their adopted father, Jeff Bogard, at the hands of local crime lord Geese Howard. Knowing that they could never beat him in their current 10-year-old forms, the two brothers vow to get stronger so that they may one day face Geese and get revenge. A decade of training later, Terry and Andy reunite in their hometown of Southtown to finally take on Geese. They learn from Wide Thai champion and newfound friend Joe Higashi that Geese is hosting a martial arts tournament known as the King of Fighters Tournament. And if there's one place to take him down, it's there. Released worldwide in arcades on November 25th, 1991, Fatal Fury came right on the heels of the fighting game boom that was just starting to gain traction thanks to Capcom's Street Fighter 2, which had come out earlier that year. Since both games have been considered to be the forerunners of said boom, it's no surprise that it led to a legendary rivalry between the two companies that lasted the decade. But enough about that. This isn't a games channel after all. Fatal Fury was an instant commercial success, and SNK knew they had to capitalize on this by expanding the franchise's reach beyond the arcades. SNK got in contact with Fuji TV to help produce a 45-minute TV special that would adapt the story of the first game. This would kill two birds with one stone, striking while the iron was hot on the original Fatal Fury game, while also helping to build up hype for the game's sequel that was due out in arcades the same month. On December 23rd, 1992, just in time for Christmas, Fatal Fury Legend of the Hungry Wolf aired on Japanese television. The plot is a retelling of the first game story, but with a few noticeable tweaks. The storytelling aspect of the game itself was limited by its medium, so the anime was given a lot of leeway in how it can tell its story. Director Hiroshi Fukutomi and his team worked very closely with SNK in figuring out how they could expand the plot that was already set in place by the game. One of the methods was giving Terry an anime-only love interest, Lily McGuire. So, have you decided to come out of your cage yet? You're a strange one. You could die in this fight tonight, but you're still worried about someone else. <laughs> She's actually a pretty good character. She's there to add some depth to the setting of Southtown, being a former street urchin forced to work with geese while still trying to make the slums livable for the other street urchins. You know, I'm just like these kids. They put on a pretty act for anyone who walks by. They're all smiles for anyone with money. It's the only way they know how to live. Not only that, but her romantic relationship with Terry does have some drama behind it since he knows that she was an accessory to his father's murder. There was also talk to make Lily the younger sister of Geese's right-hand man, Billy Kane, but that was ultimately scrapped by SNK. They did keep the idea filed away for later, though. Ultimately, though, Lily is meant to serve Terry's story because she ends up getting Rippookin by Geese out a window, thus keeping Terry's revenge motive fresh. I guess it wasn't enough to kill his dad. They also have to kill the only named female character in this anime. For real though, as much as I can compliment the addition of Lily adding some texture to this pretty basic story I will admit, the first installment of the Fatal Fury trilogy is also kind of the worst. 
The 45 minute runtime probably would have been enough at the start of production, but somewhere along the way the writers bit off more than they could chew and they end up having to rush a lot of story beats. Events like Terry's master, Tong Fu Ru, getting fatally wounded, using every last ounce of strength to teach Terry his secret technique, the Hurricane Punch, a move Terry never uses in the series, Terry mastering said technique, and Tong dying standing up would resonate harder if it a didn't happen immediately after Terry loses Lily, and B it immediately cuts to the big final storming the castle sequence after the sequence ends. And even though the animation team is working with SNK on this, it's also clear that SNK hasn't even really figured out their own characters yet. Joe Higashi isn't really the goofball he will become in later installments, which is definitely weird if you watch the movie first like I did. Like imagine this. Even among all the Kapokan fighters, I'm the only one who can stand up to him. There's nobody else. Becoming this. Oh man, if I read too many words in a row, I get sleepy. Also, I don't think Terry Bogard is the kind of guy who would sexually harass waitresses. And despite the leeway the crew was given, Geese Howard doesn't seem to get a lot to do in this special. Oh sure, he's got amazing screen presence every time he shows up with his muscles bulging from his expensive suit and his Duke Phillips looks, but he really just spends most of the runtime either sitting menacingly, defenestrating love interests, and feeding his fish. They're fighting their way up! So what? Sir? Billy and Raiden can handle them. Don't bother me right now. Oh, and they totally wasted an opportunity by having Terry knock him into his koi pond instead of off a building as tradition dictates. We don't even get a single predictabo in this anime. What a catastrophe. SNK clearly wanted to put their best foot forward with this TV special. They even hired an actual MMA fighter, Masaki Satake, to voice Joe in the Japanese version. <laughs> But I don't think that's reflected entirely well with how the anime looks. Even though the footage I have on me looks amazing thanks to Discotech's efforts in finding the original print, the animation and boarding for 90% of this anime feels very workmanlike. At best, it can look like a mid-tier OVA title, and at worst, it can look like the doodles in the margins of your algebra notes. But in spite of this, it's also here we find the anime's saving grace. Chief Animation Director and Character Designer Masami Obari puts this anime on his back. He was called in specifically by SNK just because of his work on mecha anime. Obari accepted only if SNK would send him a free Neo Geo home console and a copy of Fatal Fury in addition to his salary. Once he got his brand new Neo Geo console, Obari went to work. His character designs are done in a way that's stylized but emphasizes the character's strength and fighting acumen, and, in the case of Young Geese, giving them some awesome drip. Just ignore the fact that Andy has silver hair in the special for some reason. But it's when they are in motion that Obari's Obariness helps take this anime to the next level. Obari wants the characters to pull off their special moves in ways that look exciting and emphasize their fighting style, and if characters have to go off model in order for the action to be executed, well, so be it. All that matters is that these techniques flow well, even if the script does get those techniques wrong in some cases. Why you? It's the rising tackle! Wrong, sir. Wrong. Rising battle. Rising. Rising. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Fatal Fury Legends of the Hungry Wolf was a smash hit in ratings, with Obari's animation and designs being singled out for praise. So of course, SNK would be stupid to not make a follow-up. <laughs> What's noteworthy about Fatal Fury 2 The New Battle is that SNK decided to show a lot more confidence to the animation team. The plot of Fatal Fury 2 The Game is more bare bones by comparison to the first. A new KOF tournament has begun under the sponsorship of a mysterious German aristocrat named Wolfgang Krauser, who may or may not have a connection to Geese, and Terry, Andy, and Joe find themselves wrapped up in it. Since Legend of the Hungry Wolf was so successful, SNK decided to take a step back and let the animators do what they thought was best. They especially trusted Masami Obari, 
believing that he gave the cast a look that was very, quote, hip and new. SNK's only request would be that they make the story compelling for existing SNK fans. Directing this go-around would be Kazuhiro Furuhashi, the chief storyboard artist for all of the fight scenes in the previous special, and a close friend of Masami Obari's, who of course returned as animation director and character designer. Another reason SNK gave these two men so much power over the final product was that they were very devoted Fatal Fury fans. In my opinion, the new battle is miles better than Legend of the Hungry Wolf. One thing, the runtime is longer by about 20 minutes, so it gives us plenty of time to pace out its story. The other thing is the animation. Obari and his crew are just going off in these scenes, cranking up the Obari levels to new heights, every special move bursting with power and force and just selling the Garou crew as the utter powerhouses they are, even when they are getting utterly jobbed like Joe does in this movie. This is assisted by Furuhashi's more dynamic storyboarding that's present throughout this feature. It can make a simple and short fight like the bout between Terry and Kim Kapwan at the beginning of the anime feel way more intense. Of course, the animation isn't just focused on the fight scene. There's also the general character animation, particularly of a certain character who makes their debut in this game this anime is based off of. Oh, is that too hot for you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> yep, this is where the famous Mai Shiranui makes her anime debut. And that's Shiranui, not Shiranai as some idiots have been calling her. How stupid! And while Obari hasn't gone completely Obari with her like he did in the movie when SNK gave him the keys to the proverbial kingdom, Mai is still the number one source of the anime's fan service, and the other cast members are well aware of that. Oh my! How you have grown! <laughs> <laughs> That's your best friend's granddaughter, my dude. But I really do think the story is stronger than Legend of the Hungry Wolf because it's less an adaptation and more using the source material to tell an interesting character piece. The question the new battle asks is, what if there was not a KOF tournament and Terry just met Krauser in the street and was just utterly and totally stomped by him? And Terry has a realistic reaction to this. He doesn't get back up and vow to fight him to avenge his honor like any other anime, but instead is completely filled with self-doubt in his abilities as a fighter and spends most of the runtime drinking himself into a gutter until he is able to find his mojo again. You can't let him go anywhere near Krauser. When did you turn into such a coward? What kind of monster is this Krauser that frightened Terry so badly? And while Terry is having his own lost weekend, there is also a subplot being built that ends up getting folded into the games proper. The developers were concerned about the anime's staff ability to introduce such a va -voom character like Mai into a, such a dour story, sexy saxophone music and all. So they get around that by having the subplot be about Andy and Mai's budding romantic relationship. What kind of man are you? Gone for a whole year without even telling your fiancé? How could you? What? Fiancé? <laughs> Sure, that romantic relationship can be summed up as this. Al, let's have sex! Uh, no pig. But it does provide some levity to the proceedings. Finally! And Krauser is given a whole lot more to do than Geese was in the last anime. Obari explicitly gave Krauser a more handsome and youthful design as a way to convey the feelings of jealousy that his half-brother Geese feels for always being second best. And while Geese spends most of the runtime stewing in a cave somewhere licking his wounds, Krauser is off writing checks and snapping necks like a sultan of pain, building him up as not just any rival for Terry, but a nigh insurmountable rival, a practical wall that Terry needs to overcome if he ever wants to call himself a true fighter again. I feel alive for the first time in years, and I can feel my blood burning as it rushes through my veins. <laughs> Terry! It's a well thought out story for what could have easily just been a simple plot tied together through fight scenes. 
but it's not perfect. One reoccurring complaint that I've heard about this anime is that the setting is not clearly defined as the other two titles. Legends of the Hungry Wolf taking place entirely within Southtown and the motion picture being a globetrotting quest around the world. But in the new battle, it does seem like it is also a globetrotting quest because the game itself certainly is, but the locations are never specific enough to have any real flavor. It's either somewhere in Europe or somewhere in Asia, and that's it. Also, relating to this, some of the reasons characters have to go to certain locations are flimsy at best. For example, in order for Joe to get to where Terry is, a complete no-name extra has to pop out of a crowd and hand him a letter telling him exactly where Terry is. There's some implication that it was Geese who sent that letter because it wants Terry to take out Krauser, but it's still nakedly brute forcing a path for characters to go to the next plot point. However, those minor complaints pale in comparison to my distaste for this minor. I'm just a drunk. I can't be responsible for a little kid, you know. I'm not a kid, and I can take care of myself just fine! So in order to keep the story with Terry from getting too dark and depressing, Furuhashi had Obari create the character of Tony to be the visual foil for the audience to relate to. A kid character who follows Terry around and wishes to see him get his fighting spirit back. In theory, a perfectly fine audience surrogate. But man, oh man, does this kid rub me the wrong way. Not only did Obari overdesign him in an attempt to make him look hip and youthful and instead make him look like a breaking extra with that hair and those pants, but Tony is also a capital J jerk. The first thing he does in this anime is pick a fight with a bunch of kids who are just pretending to be Terry and Geese all just because they are disrespecting Terry by imitating him. Gatekeeping much, kid? Don't you ever joke around with the name of Terry Bogard. He's a wolf. He's the toughest fighter in the whole world. He's not a fat pig like you. And it's not like he's that plot important. He just spends the entire anime just being Terry's cheerleader and following him to taverns trying to snap Terry out of his funk by going, Aw, come on, Terry, over and over again. I understand why Furuhashi put Tony in this anime, but he is a character I frankly can do without. But anyway, Terry snaps out of his demon in a bottle storyline, mostly thanks to Lily's force ghost, darkens Krauser's doorstep, has an excellent final throwdown with him, and beats him fair and square, with the ending having him flying off to the next chapter of his story and leaving a thankfully anime-only character like Tony behind. So class, what have we learned from these TV specials? Well, the new battle is definitely the stronger of the two stories. It's not held down by the expectations of being a straight adaptation, which allows it to tell a compelling character narrative about Terry being unable to cope that he may not be the best fighter in the world. Throw in a longer runtime, more dynamic storyboarding, and an Obari that's off his leash, and it's clear which one wins out. But I do gotta give credit where credit is due with the first anime. As basic as it might be, it did show the industry that a fighting game story can be adapted into an animated format, helping to fill the spaces that couldn't be filled thanks to the limitations of the video game hardware. But, most importantly, why did both of these TV specials succeed where future fighting game adaptations failed miserably, even those funded by SNK themselves? What's wrong, Ryo? Not too busy with the karate dojo? <laughs> Dojo. Quite simply, I think it was because SNK greatly prioritized Fatal Fury's anime what with it being their newfound flagship franchise and all. Therefore, they were going to give it budgetary privileges a few afforded to other adaptations. Moreover, SNK just trusted guys like Obari and Furuhashi to just deliver. They knew these guys could do Terry Bogard and company justice and allowed them to do what they did best. There's a care scene in the Fatal Fury anime that's absent from other anime based off of SNK properties. While they are certainly flawed, the two Fatal Fury specials are evidence that the artists and animators are usually the ones fighting hard for the best visions of the characters they are given. And if you want to see that vision come true, sometimes it's best to take a step back and let them duke it out with the creative process. Because as we see, the final results will almost always be a winner.